Hi, I'm Deborah schmidt Lobis, and I'm here to talk about the concerts upcoming this summer at the Colorado Music Festival on July 13th, 7.30 p.m. at Chautauqua Auditorium in Boulder, Colorado. This is a concert of music by composer John Corigliano, and he is the Colorado Music Festival's composer in residence this summer. He's been called one of the great storytellers of American music, and I think he truly is. But for right now, I'm not going to talk about the concert as much as I want to give you a little background into John, um, kind of a fascinating man. He's probably one of the most prolific and well-known composers of his time. He's composed works for solo instruments, for orchestra, chamber groups, for opera, choral works, and of course he's done film scores. Um, he's done four film scores, I think, maybe the second one was in 1980 and we may remember some of that it's called altered states but the one we all pretty much know of uh won him an oscar for best film score in 1999 and that was the red violin which was of course a gorgeous score he's a pulitzer prize winner has five grammy awards the grawmeyer award for music composition and of course that oscar he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and then taught at Manhattan School of Music, was on the faculty, the Lehman College City University in New York, has been on the faculty of Juilliard School and amongst others. His awards and accolades are really more than I can list in my short time here, but I thought I'd let you in on a few things from his childhood that I think are kind of fun and how he evolved as a composer. His mother was a piano teacher and he said he took two lessons from her and it didn't stick. He said it was just too hard for a son and a mother to deal with piano lessons. He then took two clarinet lessons. He said that didn't stick either. So obviously he wasn't into playing instruments quite so much. However, his father was the concert master of the New York Philharmonic. And because of that, he went to the concerts often, heard orchestra. His father played concertos with that orchestra often and was very well known in his day. So the funny thing about that is Curiliano says he got stage fright from watching his father. He would be at home hearing him practice and he couldn't sit in the audience when he was actually performing. He would go backstage or in the green room and listen from afar because <clears throat> he was so fearful that his father would miss something. So I think it was obvious at that point he wasn't going to be a performer because he didn't like the stress of that. However, even though he didn't take piano lessons from his mom, he did play piano by ear. And when in high school, he became actually quite a popular kid because he uh, played with singers and for choral groups and musicals, that kind of thing. Um, he had a teacher who really saw his inherent talent and sort of spurred him on to composing. So he did go on to study composition at Columbia University and at the Manhattan School. And he studied with some famous people probably the one known, the one name we might know would be Paul Creston. Um, but he had a fun, he had some funny jobs before he became known as a composer. He was a music director at like an NPR station in New York City. He was also uh, a music director, well, actually kind of a session producer, they called it in that era for artists, one of who was Andre Watts, who was a famous pianist. He was also the assistant to the producer of the Leonard Bernstein Young People's Concerts. And for any of us old enough to remember those, we know they were instrumental in bringing music and orchestral music to all of us across the United States. In fact, I probably heard my first Mozart piano sonata through Leonard Bernstein in one of those wonderful concerts. You can still find those on YouTube, by the way. So he got to work with some great people. 
but also think about it. When he was young, he was going to that orchestra all the time and hearing his father play, but hearing other instrumentalists and he got to know many of them. And although he was studying at college during this time uh, that he had these other jobs, he really didn't, I don't know that he hit it big, but he wasn't really noticed until he wrote a violin and piano sonata in 1964 and entered it into the Spoleto Chamber Music Competition. He was the only person, the only winner at that chamber music competition that year. And that violin sonata was played by many, a famous person. But his father, who he gave it to, probably was instigated by um, or inspired by, he never played it for many years. Many famous people played it, but his father refused to even look at it. And then eventually someone really kind of goaded him into it and he got it out, he looked at it and he really performed it the rest of his life. So his parents weren't really that hot on him becoming a composer. They wanted him to become a lawyer or a doctor, somehow that he could you know, make a living. <laughs> So in about 1977, that access to the symphony was a real advantage because the New York Phil commissioned him to write a clarinet concerto for their clarinet player, Stanley Drucker. So that was kind of the beginning of commissions. Now he had many other pieces in between all this that I'm gonna just skim over because he's got a lot. In 1987, he was the first composer to serve as composer in residence for the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. During that time, he composed his first symphony. That was inspired by the AIDS epidemic and to honor friends he had lost. It was after that that he won the Grammy Award for his music composition. And this was in 1991, he got that award and then his first Grammy for the best classical contemporary composition in 1992. So that's probably where it all began. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the concert upcoming because if we played John's music all night, we, well, we'd be there for weeks. It's really, it's really great. And if you get a chance, uh, find some recordings, go on YouTube, it's worth listening to. On this concert on July 13th, we're gonna hear the gazebo dances. And that was originally written for piano, four hands. So piano duet. So I listened to that because it's since been orchestrated for band and obviously for orchestra. So the first movement is an or overture and it's fun. Second movement is what he calls a peg-legged waltz. The third movement is an adagio it's absolutely exquisitely beautiful. And the fourth movement is a fun tarantella. And he wrote these uh, pieces, these gazebo pieces, because he said all across America, people in the summer are sitting in parks listening to music that are being played on gazebos. So uh, I wouldn't say it was fluffy music, but a little more fluffy than his usual. Although I've listened to both the piano and the uh, orchestral version, especially the third movement. Wow. You can see there that he is beginning his obsession or his working with woodwind instruments. In that movement, he uses four saxophones and I think it's six clarinets. Now we're talking soprano, alto, tenor, all that, but it's just beautiful. And you can hear with the oboe soaring over the woodwinds where he's going with his music. It's just lovely. So we're also going to be performing at the music festival, One Sweet Morning. And this was written, it was jointly commissioned by the New York Philharmonic and the Shanghai Symphony Orchestra to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. He had initially turned down this commission about a year after 9-11 because he felt it was too fresh. 
And actually John Adams ended up taking on that uh, composition. He wrote the Transmigration of Souls and won the 2002 Pulitzer for that. But anyway, John, I mean, yeah, John Crigliano ended up writing this 10 years later and it's for mezzo, soprano and orchestra. The first, what he really wanted to do was use many different poets from different countries and felt that it wasn't just about 9-11, it's about war and warring in every country, in every era of time. So the first movement, he uses uh, uh, the lyrics by Polish, Polish poet Milos. It's very sad and longing sounding. And it's called A Song for the End of Worlds. The second movement is called Patroclus. And it's set to a portion of Homer's Iliad detailing a massacre led <laughs> by Patroclus. So Patroclus in the Iliad is a childhood friend of Achilles, in case you're interested. It's very wild and has fanfares and kind of almost scary. The third movement is set to the poem, War South of the Great Wall. And this is by eighth century poet, Li Po. The fourth and final movement is set to the anti-war poem, one Sweet Morning by E.Y. Harwood. And we might remember that Yip Harwood, Harwood, they called him Yip, his name was E.Y., but Yip wrote the lyrics to The Wizard of Oz, and of course that famous Over the Rainbow. And I think he also wrote words to Brigadoon. So Corleano loved this anti-war poem. He said, it looks forward to that one sweet morning when out of flags and bones, under the clover, in spring, peace will come and spring will bloom again. So they'll be performing this at the music festival uh, with wonderful soprano, mezzo-soprano, Kelly O'Connor. And she's been touted as having the voice of pure gold. She's also an, a Grammy Award winner for best opera recording. So I think this will be a beautiful piece. I've listened to it and it's extremely moving and touching. However, <laughs> here we go on to the triathlon, the more recent piece of Corleano. And although I'm excited to hear the other pieces, I'm truly excited to hear Timothy McAllister play again because his world-class saxophonist and a tour de force. So I'm reading a quote here. Triathlon is called one of the tour de force pieces written specifically for saxophonist Timothy McAllister. He's been a professor of saxophone at the University of Michigan. He teaches saxophone at Interlochen in the summers in Switzerland and in Canada and at Northwestern. He's premiered over 250 new works, including pieces by Gunther Schuller, William Balcom, and a really important concerto was dedicated to him by John Adams in 2013. He is a soprano chair, the soprano saxophone chair of the Prism Saxophone Quartet, regularly performs with Chicago Symphony Orchestra, the Cabrillo Festival Orchestra, and the Los Angeles Orchestra has over 50 albums as a soloist and chamber musician and an orchestral saxophonist. We heard him here last season and having grown up playing the saxophone, I was truly astonished and amazed at his technical facility as well as his lovely tone. Quiliano said he was inspired by McAllister and wrote, the wonderful joy that virtuosos can bring to music with passion and power. This is Timothy McAllister, and it truly is. I've heard many of re recordings of him. 
and I listened to interviews of Tim. And he's not only a fabulous, most amazing player who makes playing the saxophone sound simple, um, he's a nice guy. So it's obvious from some of these interviews I've listened to that Tim and Corleano have collaborated a bit on these because Corleano, of course, always wants to stretch any instrument to the nth degree. And there were some very difficult passages to execute for McAllister. But being the pro he is, he's up to the challenge. Now, if you don't know anything about saxophones, there's something you blow into and it takes a certain amount of energy and power and you need to be in shape. I guess it's kind of like being a trumpet player or any kind of wind player. You really do have to be in shape. And this particular piece that Corleano wrote is for three saxophones. I don't think there's ever been a piece that's used a soprano saxophone, an alto and a baritone all in one solo kind of piece. And it lasts about 30 minutes. So Tim actually talked about the physicality of playing those three different saxophones over this period of time. Starting with the smallest instrument that he's most comfortable with, then going to the alto, but then going to the baritone, which is the largest, that takes a lot of power and a lot of blowing, okay? He said he literally has to keep in physical shape to do this and he has to pace himself. I haven't really played the baritone saxophone much. I've tried to blow into it and I know. It's, it's a big instrument, takes a lot. And in these pieces, uh, <laughs> Corleano literally goes as low as you can go and greater highs than you ever usually play. So his use of woodwinds in, the, in this piece is wonderful as well. I've only been able to listen to the second movement because it's on YouTube. Um, so these pieces are called, these three pieces, the first piece is called Leaps and that's for soprano sax. The second movement is called Lines for alto and the third is called Licks. So the second movement, which I've listened to, that one being called uh, Lines, whew, it's just beautiful. He uses woodwinds in this piece in such a beautiful way. It has this opening clarinet moment and then the saxophone imitates that. These beautiful, gorgeous, long lines. I might even just call it absolutely exquisite. It is worth the price of admission, it's beautiful. The third movement is of course kind of wild and um, it's called licks. From what I can tell, I actually could look up the score online and I didn't download them, but I looked through it. It's like, whoa. So at the end of the third movement, he has to go back to the soprano sax. So for anybody who plays a woodwind instrument, you know that the embouchure to play a soprano, then an alto, then a baritone, then go back to the soprano. It's a very different kind of thing. So he's eagerly challenged, I believe. So my sense um, of this concert, it's going to be a highlight. Uh, between the vibrant, really fascinating, and electric Corleano compositions, the singing of mezzo Kelly O'Connor, and the saxophone virtuosity of Timothy McAllister, all in one concert. Wow. I'm truly ecstatic to hear this music and about this concert. I hope you will join us. Thank you for your time.